bet the board. What do you mean you don't bet? I mean, I don't bet. You know, I don't care. I don't. Wizard. I never have and I never will. Yeah, right. I'll bet you 20 bucks I can get you gambling before the end of the day. You owe me 15 grand, pal. Pay him. Pay that man his money. It's the Bet the Board podcast. God likes me. He really, really likes me. In the end, I wound up right back where I started. I could still pick winners, and I could still make money for all kinds of people back home. And why mess up a good thing? Here's Payne Insider and Todd Furman. Welcome into the Bet the Board College Football Podcast. Playoff rankings revealed. We know the committee has no clue, but that has no bearing on what we'll do around these fine parts on a Wednesday morning. I'm your host, Todd Furman, joined as always by my esteemed colleagues and co-host, Brad Powers and Payne Insider. And gentlemen, how goes it this fine Wednesday? Going well. Looking forward to this one. Hanging in there. Surviving. (laughs) I mean, we're going to we have go. to get you on the energy energy drink kick. We're going to have to get you a <laughs> guzzling coffee by the gallons. Brad, you and I may have to put together a little pep talk for Payne to get those energy levels up, especially because he does this show three hours later in his time zone than where you and I have to get up on the West Coast. Uh, no excuses. I mean, we're getting close to 10 o'clock his time as we're recording this. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that means it's I've been a- working for the last five hours. You guys just oh, woke up. Oh, here we go. Should be yeah, lo- yeah, should yeah. be lunchtime for you over there. Is is what it should be. We we'll start using Brad's hashtag and no days off over there, Payne. And you pull yeah, twenty. It's s- still in the fast. Still in the fast. I don't eat until about uh, one o'clock. Oh, Brad, has Payne ever gone into the? Not to go off on a tangent because we got a lot of ground to cover. Has Payne ever gone through the fa- intermittent fasting approach with you uh, in any capacity? No. Oh, is no. it uh, is it lengthy like his four state conversations? <laughs> <laughs> no, this one has a somewhat happy resolution. The jury's still oh, okay. out on Florida State and how all of that'll transpire. But that may be a good discussion for a different day. Uh, we know the playoff <laughs> rankings were revealed last night. Instead of us getting into those, because I think Brad Payne believes that's where I wanted to go right off the top of the show. I'm going to throw a curveball. We're going to wait till Thank next. Thank God you didn't. Nope, we're going to wait till no, next. No, it's week. irrelevant to me. It's the most useless conversation we're waiting to ever fucking have. People it's a bunch like of corporate dis- people who bought time slots and decided people to, like discussion to topics here. pain they like no, to know how the gamblers view things versus the way the committee goes about it but i'm going to save Pretty you easy the odds didn't move i'm going to save you the trouble i'm going to save you the aggravation and we're not going to talk anything about that now <laughs> instead we have a nice little appetizer where normally we insert the non-powers five game into the midst of our big game breakdowns but given that we go in rotation order around these fine parts it's at the top of the board early kickoff from columbia south carolina where the Jacksonville State Gamecocks, led by head coach Rich Rodriguez, travel to take on Shane Beamer and South Carolina. It's the home team. More than a two-touchdown favorite. Pretty much 15.5 across the board. Total hovering in that 54.5-55 range. And Brad, we've seen some of these games in the past. We know the SEC likes to give themselves a de facto bye week where teams from the Sun Belt, teams from Conference USA, step out of their comfort zone, have to step up in class. And the market has often struggled with some of these spots. When you look at a game like this, do you feel there's an angle worth exploiting, whether it's on a dog, treading in the right direction, or a favorite that finally has a chance to punch down in class? I've come around to more, I'm on the favorite punching down this time of year. Uh, obviously, you got to look at motivation for margin. I think you have it here with South Carolina, and that's going to be the pick here. We're going to take South Carolina minus the 15 and a half. Start off with a power rating. I made it 17. So why is my power rating you know, pr- pretty disparate from the market uh, th- th- that opened this even lower than this number here? Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the strength of schedule disparities. A lot of modelers out there in today's day and age in college football. If there's one thing that those modelers still struggle with, it's strength of schedule and, and op- opponent adjustments, especially when you have such a disparity here. I mean, in some metrics, South Carolina has played the toughest schedule in the country so far this year. Jacksonville State. If you throw in the FCS teams, which I do because uh, uh, obviously I power rate FCS as well, number one, 33rd strength of schedule. So basically toughest versus weakest strength of schedule. And to me, I, it was, so how do we take advantage of this? Well, you just ask yourself a simple question. You don't change anything about the team's makeup, composition, coaches, players, you name it. Just flip-flop these team schedules and have South Carolina play Jacksonville State schedule and have Jacksonville State play South Carolina schedules. And you tell me what this line is if you got 8-1 and one South Carolina playing 1-7 and seven Jacksonville State. Uh, not going to be 15-and-a-half in my opinion. Uh, 
And, you know, looking further specifically into this matchup, it kind of has similar vibes to me. South Carolina played Furman earlier this year, uh, and no relation to Todd. Uh, but uh, uh, top ten, Furman's a top 10 FCS team, so a really good FCS team. That, that's their only loss of the season was South Carolina. Market was cute. It opened right around 14, got bet up to 17. South Carolina had motivation uh, to, to get a win there off a, you know, a, a loss to start the season against North Carolina. And South Carolina took care of business, won the game by more than three touchdowns. Uh, I just think at two and six, South Carolina obviously needs to win out to get the bowl eligibility. I also, this is in the weeds a little bit, Jacksonville State, when you got a big dog, you want a team to run – slow tempo. Jacksonville State doesn't. They run a lot of tempo. So you're going to see more plays in this game. And that more plays to me means more opportunities for South Carolina to show their superiority here. And finally, uh, you know, Jacksonville State, decent record. But when they have played a couple of teams with a pulse this year, 18 point loss to Liberty, two touchdown loss to Coastal. I mean, those are by far the two best teams that they played so far. And if you do get to a backup situation with South Carolina, I'm going to give you a name to know. The backup quarterback for South Carolina, Lenoris Sellers. Love this kid. He was one of the three, four uh, young quarterbacks that caught my eye in the spring. He also caught my eye in the Furman game. Uh, I think he'll uh, impress here in a fourth quarter situation. So let's go ahead. I typically don't do this. It's usually short dogs, short favorites, but we're going to lay the 15 and a half here with South Carolina. Brad, when you look at Conference USA from top to bottom, power rated worse than the MAC or on a similar level, given what we've seen from that league so far this season? Oh, it's similar. It's really bad. By far, they're the two worst. I mean, there's such a gap between those two conferences and even the Mountain West, the Sun Belt, American, obviously. I haven't gotten to that yet. I Boy, the Mac's pretty bad. Yeah, I mean, you got a good one. Uh, as we're taping this on a Wednesday night, I mean, it's bottom two teams in the country are in the Mac and Akron and Kent State. <laughs> hey, look, uh, we've been blessed with a lot of Tuesday and Wednesday college football. Uh, I won't call it high-end product by any stretch of the imagination, <laughs> but it's out there for the degenerate to take full advantage of. And, and like you texted me yesterday, Payne, only the Mac, where a team opens two, steams to six, and never leads for a second, oftentimes finding themselves down by three touchdowns like we saw with NIU <laughs> on the road in Mount Pleasant against Central Michigan yesterday. What a league. The days of Big Ben and company walking through those doors to give us some fun games to watch appears to be a thing of yesteryear with the transfer portal. All right, boys, let's get into uh, some of the bigger fish to fry on the Saturday slate. Uh, And we can start with a game in LA under the lights at the Coliseum where USC will welcome in Washington. It's Washington, a three and a half point road favorite total, one of the largest on the board that we've seen in the regular season, going all the way back to UCLA's matchup last year with USC at 76 and a half. Two of the highest scoring teams in the FBS this season. USC comes in second overall with a shade less than 46 points per game. Washington ninth with more than 40 points per contest. And when you look at USC, their games have averaged 78.4 points per game. It's the most in the FBS. Washington, better from a points per game scoring standpoint on the defensive side than what we have seen from the Trojans. Meanwhile, maybe water meeting its level a little bit for the Huskies. The last four wins by 27 combined points after Washington first four wins of the season all came by 27 plus points. They're 8-0 for the first time since going to the college football playoff back in 2016. When you listen to Kalen DeBoer's comments, not last night uh, on the playoff selection reveal show, uh, but in the wake of their game against Stanford over the weekend, so the team was dealing with the flu. They weren't at full strength last week in the practice leading up to it. Meanwhile, USC, uh, no stranger to ATS failures. They're tied for the nation's longest ATS skid of six games, and clearly Clearly plenty of criticism and boo birds coming out for Lincoln Riley and the way his team hasn't been buttoned up. Brad, when we look at this Washington team offensively, we know it's led by Michael Penix. There's not much in the way of a complimentary ground game. We've seen Dylan Johnson get more involved, uh, but with limited success. A dynamic tandem at receiver in Roma Dunze alongside Jalen Polk. Should have been a three-headed monster, but Jalen McMillan hasn't been able to get healthy. Went out there last week, tested the knee, looked to be... You know, more at this point talking about a potential medical redshirt that just won't allow him to get going, but they also played without Giles Jackson, and there's some talk that they may shut him down as well going forward, but they're playing against the defense that offers no resistance whatsoever. We saw Utah go up and down the field. We saw Cal hang 49 on them and come up just short of an outright upset as a 10-point dog. Washington's offense against the Trojans' defense. How does this play out Saturday night? 
Yeah, breaking news here, uh, or not so much. Uh, Washington significant edge in this matchup, to say the least. One of the bigger edges that you know in a high profile games that we do all year long on these podcasts, probably going to be one of the biggest advantages that we see in these matchups. But uh, you know, Washington's offense, the counting stats are there. I mean, top ten in, in yards per play, yards per game, points per game. Uh, but last couple of games against below average teams in Arizona State and Stanford. Hasn't looked great, uh, and I questioned it at the end of the Oregon game. Is Michael Penix banged up a little bit? Uh, you know, the, the market, well, is some funky numbers in that Arizona State game coming off the big win against Oregon. Uh, and, the, I mean, just, again, uh, you know, you look at his performance, 60% the last two weeks, 4-3 ratio. Mm, that, that, to me, doesn't scream a lot of confidence here uh, unless, you know, we're miraculously he is healthy again. This is a kid that, that's dealt with significant injuries throughout his entire career. Uh, but still, I mean, overall in the season, you got a top 10 quarterback here, to say the least, borderline top five. The, the thing that they've struggled with here is not only, you know, Penix being a little off the last couple weeks, but – a little bit more one-dimensional than I think Kalen DeBoer would even like. I mean, they did have a little bit of a ground game earlier in the season, games two through five, at least enough to, to, to keep teams from, you know, dropping guys back and co- so many guys back in coverage. Games two through five, 135 rushing yards per game, cut in half the last three weeks. So when you're so one-dimensional – and, and obviously Penix is off a little bit, then, then you get performances like you've got in the last two weeks. You mentioned the receiver core. I mean, it, if you're just looking at top two, it's right there with LSU uh, as far as a one-two punch in America. Some of the best. Ohio State, another one, obviously, went, went healthy. Uh, I, I don't see – even if they're not – Penix is a little off compared to what he was early in the season. Even if the ground game isn't as good as what it was early in the season – I still find it very hard to not see a lot of success here for Washington's offense. If Cal can have a lot of success with a freshman quarterback and a four-string running back late in the game, I think Washington will be just fine. And speaking of USC's defense, I, the major thing that I see is, you know, first four games this season, obviously against questionable com- uh, opposition, but they did look improved at that point in the season, the first month. I mean, they were only allowing 20 points per game, about 365 yards per game. Last five weeks, mm, back to, to what we saw at the end of last year, 43 points per game, 466 yards per game. And, and if you, you, I question if they're running out of gas a little bit. Keep in mind, USC's got a very unique schedule this year. They're playing a seventh straight week. That's more than anybody in the country right now. And where does that show up? If you've got tired legs, well, your, your, your pass rush maybe isn't there, and that's exactly what's happened. And if there's one thing that the USC defense did well early in the season was get after the quarterback. First six games, 22 sacks. Last three games, USC's defense has a total of one sack, so they're not getting pressure. Uh, Washington's offense doesn't give up uh, any sacks or pressure. I mean, they did five sacks on 311 pass attempts. So if SC can't get to the quarterback, uh, Penix is going to have a field day here. And, and again, uh, when you look at USC recently in, on the injury front, one of their better players that was trending up in recent weeks, Zion Branch, he's out for the year after getting hurt in the Cal game. Mm, I'll be stunned. I'll be stunned if we're not seeing 35 plus here for Washington's offense. You mentioned all the struggles for USC's defense, Brad. And only five Power Five defenses are allowing more points per game so far this year. Cal, who USC beat last week, Vanderbilt, Colorado, and Stanford. Not exactly the company you want to keep for a team that came into the season with conference championship aspirations that are still very much alive and maybe getting into the college football playoff. They've allowed 34 plus points in five straight games for the first time since they became a member of the FBS going all the way back to 1922. So if USC's defense isn't going to get a lot of stops, Payne, clearly the offense is going to have to carry the water for this team to be able to pull off a minor upset. And when we look at Caleb Williams, 29 total touchdowns, 10 giveaways in 10 games versus ranked teams, 80 total touchdowns and seven giveaways in 20 games versus unranked teams. All the talk about ranked opponents, this, that, and the other. A lot of those teams play defense at a lot more physical level than what USC is going to see this week against Washington. Uh, But there's clearly the buzzard circulating around this program. USC's potential last stand. In comes a Washington defense that has shown vulnerability through the air and on the ground in recent weeks. USC's offense against the Huskies defense, can they do enough to match Ask all of the defensive deficiencies that are no doubt going to be on full display against Michael Penix. Is this the turning point of not just this season, but the Lincoln Riley tenure? 
No doubt. It has inflection point written all over it in terms of if USC alums continue to put their support behind Lincoln or they officially got, no, we've seen enough of this experience. Uh, We're going to now try and drive a Brinks truck up to Seattle and get Pete Carroll back. I think we talked (laughs) off air, right? If they go eight and four this year and you kind of look at that recruiting class, this doesn't feel like uh, positive steps forward. Uh, Kind of left field there but I think if we're, we're kind of honing back here on, on USC's offense you know if you're just combing numbers right like points per drive yards per play success rate explosiveness it, it looks fine relatively on par to, to last season and then all of a sudden you watch the games and it just it looks different it feels clunky there's not always a rhythm and you know I, I went back I've watched like the last three or four USC games And it just doesn't feel like there's one specific big problem that you're like, hey, this is this is it. We can fix this. There's like five small things that seem to all kind of interchange and and rear their heads from play to play. Offensive line has had some issues. You brought this to my attention, Todd, but it is clear as day now that you look at some of the numbers and you watch it visually. There is not a clear go to number one receiver like there is. There's not an Addison here who's who's consistently open. USC is not getting the ball to its most consistent weapon, and that's the the other USC transfer, the Gamecock, Marshawn Lloyd. Yeah. He's not getting it enough. Formationally, there's not a lot of disguise. We're just like lining up and shotgun and going three, four wide and just saying, hey, get, you know, go make a play, Caleb. And then some of the things that we've mentioned in the past with Caleb Williams picking up some bad habits, throwing off the back foot, sidearming everything, not playing within structure, and then probably – you know, for financial reasons, he's not using his legs as much. The big thing for Caleb against Washington, I think he has to be willing to take a profit. You can't always read deep to intermediate and then short last. There are paths to points here for USC if Caleb Williams is is willing to take a profit. You just look at the last three games for Washington's defense. It's Oregon, obviously very good offense. Then it's Arizona State and then it's Stanford. Bo Nix, Trenton Borgay and Ashton Davis, when they were kept clean and able to make a quick decision, they benefited from it. A combined 52 for 64 for those three quarterbacks in the zero to nine yard passing window. Because Washington plays five defensive backs, it's it's tough to hit the massive deep shot, right? They're top 15 in explosive pass defense, and that's against a schedule of offenses that's top 12 in the country. So if Caleb Williams is going to sit back there in the pocket and try to hunt deep balls and not kind of hit that quick throw game and, and take what he's given, um, that's going to be a little bit of a problem. Going back to Marshawn Lloyd, I think you just he's averaging 3.6 yards per rush before first contact, nearly eight yards per rush on the season. This isn't a matchup against a Washington defense that plays a 4-2-5 where USC's offensive line should have issues getting push. Huskies are outside the top 100 in schedule adjusted defensive line yards allowed, have it created tackles for loss and EPA per rush. So this should be a balanced USC offense. I know USC is generally speaking a little dainty, but it just it's far easier to go right at Washington than trying to go around them. Part of the reason you're seeing some early week USC money is the defensive injuries for Washington. They got four key cogs that are either battling to get back but won't be 100% or they're going to miss the game altogether. Thule on the inside has missed the last three games for Washington. He traveled to Stanford as an emergency player that could give the Huskies a couple snaps in a dire situation. He should be back against USC, but I can't envision a full workload there for him. Shell of himself, you, I'd imagine. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at this 4 2 5 defensive system that Washington runs, they like to play three safeties a lot. So Cam Fab, uh, Asa Turner, and Vincent Nunnally are all banged up. Nunnally sounds like he's going to miss the game per Kalen uh, DeBoer's presser this week. Cam Fab says he feels good about playing, but didn't log a practice all last week or early this week. Asa Turner missed last week. He's day to day. So monitoring those four injuries, I think, on Washington's defense from now till kick will be really important. And ultimately, I think that might decide where this game stays uh, if the hook is still there or if it it ends up going away here. Um, to your point, Todd, this this does feel like the the very last stand for for USC, and we may get the uh, the best effort out of them. But certainly, uh, to Brad's point, their defense is a little scary. And I know a gentleman who joined our podcast a few years ago, Booger McFarland, said if you gave USC the entire alphabet, 
they couldn't spell defense where they're going to need a little bit of defense uh, this week. <laughs> Quick question for you guys, and I'll leave it relatively open-ended. So if either of you want to jump in, how do you assess Washington in the wake of what we've seen the last two weeks? Uh, obviously, we saw them come back against Oregon, get that big win at home uh, to keep themselves very much in the driver's seat in the Pac-12. You can understand a little bit of a letdown against Arizona State, but Brad, you mentioned it. It wasn't just a letdown of a team not being buttoned up. It was uncharacteristic to decision making it was a lot of little things that left you going okay is this just a one game sample size and they follow it up to some extent last week against Stanford more so on the defensive side uh, I know a lot of our listeners whether they've been doing this for a long time or this is the first season that they've really done a deep dive in college football when you're trying to assess Washington's full body of work do you place more emphasis on those two data points or do we go you know what we've seen enough of this Huskies team to the first six games that the game against Stanford the game against Arizona State are an outlier and we can expect them to look a little bit more like a team right now on the outside looking into the college football playoff? It's a good question. Uh, I'm going to take the political answer and say it's probably a little bit of both. Uh, For me, I I think when you have a a team like Washington, obviously they're frontline players, uh, 1 through 22, really good. But, you know, the the differences between the Washingtons, the playoff contenders in recent years, and the national title contenders has been the next 22, uh, where you get that, you know, we mentioned this before we came on, that lull in the season. How good are your, your guys, uh, 22 through 44, when, when your starters are a little bit banged up and you're after a big game at, at, against Oregon? How are those guys performing when they get in the lineup? And I just, I, from a recruiting aspect, Washington isn't there in the Georgias and the Ohio States of the world. So I think it's some of that. Uh, and then I, we, we also mentioned this. I, their offense leads a little bit to be desired. Up front on the offensive line, uh, up front on the defensive line as well, but specifically offensively, when you're already kind of one-dimensional in your pass-first offense, you need a little bit of ground game. Uh, to, to keep defenses off balance a little bit. You got that for a majority of those first six games. You haven't gotten it the last three weeks. I mean, you have no ground game. So when then it's fully on Penix and he has an off game, well, <laughs> then you get one score games against you know below average teams. Yep, it's a great point, and uh, I think the other thing to kind of button this game up, you mentioned USC and the unique schedule they're playing. Seventh game in a row, they'll play nine straight to close out the campaign. I know Trojans fans joked, oh, it's the perfect schedule for us. We'll have a week off before the Pac-12 championship. Lo and behold, USC, unless you do something Herculean down the stretch, you're just going to have an extra week to prepare your backup quarterback for a bowl game. Washington, (laughs) USC, maybe a nightcap game, uh, but a game it'll be going head-to-head with will be LSU Alabama, and it's the Crimson tied a field goal favorite in Tuscaloosa as they'll welcome in the Bayou Bengals total on the game 60 60 and a half and even a 61 popped up in the market this will mark the fourth total of 60 or higher in this rivalry game over the last five meetings last year was LSU getting by Alabama 32 31 in overtime winning outright as a 13 and a half point dog the two years before that LSU came in catching more than four touchdowns and it was back in 2019 where Joe Burrow and company went into Bryant-Denny Sandium won outright 46-41 catching five when we look at some of the SEC title game scenarios Alabama will need a little bit of help from Ole Miss this week to lock up a spot in Atlanta if they're going to take care of business on their own end meanwhile if LSU pulls off the upset Ole Miss beats Texas A&M there'd be a three-way tie atop the west all at five and one with a lot still to be decided. When we look at Alabama, this will be the worst ranking when facing LSU since they were number 17 in the country back in 2007, which was Nick Saban's first year as the Alabama head coach. It's the 23rd meeting between these programs when both were inside the top 15. Bama leads the series in those encounters with a 16-6 and six mark. Uh, when you look at last year's matchup, it was only the third time both teams had scored 30 points in a meeting. Feels like a distant memory when we watch these two teams play an instant classic where it was all about kicking field goals and hoping one team could get across the 50-yard line a handful of times. Meanwhile, LSU, they've since righted the ship after losing 55-49 to Ole Miss. They've now scored 48-plus points in a program record four straight, starting with that loss. It's the longest streak in 119 seasons at the FBS level for them. Meanwhile, Alabama should be coming in with a little momentum in their own right. They were plus 27 in the second half. Alabama's best margin after the break since its season opening game against Middle Tennessee State. 
When we look at some of the things in this contest, Brad, LSU's offense, again, much like USC's in a game we previewed earlier, going to have to do an awful lot to keep some of the pressure off the defense, but they have the highest scoring offense in the country at 47.4 points per game. They've gone over 500 yards in seven straight contests, and Jaden Daniels has firmly asserted his case as a Heisman Trophy front runner uh, with some of the gaudy numbers he's put up. You look at the weapons, Brian Thomas, Malik Neighbors, Logan Diggs emerging as the true running back, but in steps in Alabama defense that while they've looked good and they've trended in the right direction, no doubt is going to see LSU's high-powered aerial attack as a jolt to the system given what they've played over the last four or five weeks. Yeah, so I'm going to let Nick Saban uh, dictate uh, my, my preview a little bit here in this matchup. And he said this three years ago, uh, good defense doesn't beat good offense anymore. That was Nick Saban talking, uh, the, the, the defensive mind of Nick Saban. And what we have here is an LSU offense that, quite frankly, is the best offense in the country. Uh, you know, by, by many simple metric, yards per play number one, yards per game number one, points per game number one. Uh, Jaden Daniels, uh, if he performs well, and LSU were to pull an outright upset here, might end up becoming the Heisman favorite. I mean, he's number two in the country in opponent-adjusted quarterback EPA per play, uh, number two in QBR. Uh, the, the, the simple stats are there, 25 touchdowns, only three picks, 500-plus rushing yards. He can give you something that, that, that some of the other top quarterbacks in the country can't uh, as far as the mobility. Logan Diggs has settled in as that feature back. You mentioned that, Todd. Uh, zero carries in that opener against Florida State. I guess he wasn't ready for uh, the system. Uh, now he's the feature back, and the offense has taken it to that next level. Also, what's taken it to the next level, this one-two punch at wide receiver uh, and neighbors and, and Brian Thomas because the teams roll over the coverage. Brian Thomas usually has uh, takes advantage of it. So neighbors leads the nation receiving between the two of them, 20 receiving touchdowns. I will say this is the best defense that they have faced, obviously, this year, with all due respect to Florida State in the opener. Uh, Alabama defense. It's a good Alabama defense. It's not a great one. It's not, you know, one that they'll remember in the history books there in Tuscaloosa. Uh, one advantage that I do see Alabama having in this matchup, pass rush, uh, which has really gotten going for Alabama here the last six games, 26 sacks, one-two punch of Dallas Turner, Chris Braswell. Uh, as good as any uh, getting after the quarterback. And that would be the one weakness that LSU has a little bit. Jaden Daniels prone to taking hits he shouldn't. Uh, you still got a relatively young offensive line there for LSU playing in an unbelievable atmosphere here at night. Uh, so that would be my one concern here as far as, you know, rubber stamping, hey, big edge LSU's offense in this matchup. I, you know, the, the thing that I, I think about, I love this. I love the adjustments I've seen from Alabama defensively. Second half against Ole Miss, second half against Tennessee. Texas game still worries me a little bit, uh, where they faced a balanced offense and they just cannot make plays. Could not get off the field late in the game. Obviously, Ewers hit some deep shots in that one. There'll be some deep shots here. I'm wondering how LSU attacks that. The, you know, the, the guy that's had a really good season for Alabama, still a true freshman, Caleb Downs, the quarterback on the back end. Uh, do they take advantage of him uh, a, a time or two? He's got to have his best game of his young career so far. So uh, edge to LSU here. Uh, they, I think it's going to be up to the other side of the ball, uh, the, w which will di uh, more dictate this game. Brad, you mentioned LSU, or excuse me, Alabama's game against Texas early in the year, and I feel like that's probably the most relevant data point. When we look at who Alabama's faced in recent weeks in terms of passing offenses, LSU comes into this contest second behind Washington. Last week, it was Tennessee. We uh, haven't exactly been shy about our Joe Milton slander around these parks with a 74th ranked passing attack. Arkansas outside the top 100. Texas A&M 37th, but that includes data points with Connor Wegman. I think there's a lot of noise in that number as well. Uh, we look at Mississippi State just inside the top 100 and Ole Miss leans on the ground game to get things going through the air. Texas, of course, to your point, hunted the deep ball, had six passing plays that went for 20 plus yards, had a great success rate and a third of their drives offensively graded out explosive. But Payne, LSU's offense clearly going to have to hum on all cylinders because other than 
you know, what's going on with this LSU offense. The defense leaves a lot to be desired. And there's a good chance if Brian Kelly has either of your phone numbers on speed dial, he may want to call in one of the two of you to play defensive back this week against Alabama, knowing how depleted LSU is on the back end. He insteps in Alabama offense, 51st in the country in scoring. They've struggled in the red zone, five games with less than 30 points this season, had just six such games over the last two seasons combined. When we look at Alabama's offense, against an LSU's defense that's missing some key pieces. Who has the edge, and how does this side unfold Saturday night in Tuscaloosa? Yeah, I think LSU fans, scoreboard watching, possibly think the defense has has turned a corner to to semi-competent, right? Because they gave up 18 combined points the last two games, and now all of a sudden you can take that confidence into the bye week and come out the other side stronger. I just don't see that happening. Uh, 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 Auburn can't throw the football outside the top 100 in EPA per pass. Army against an above average SEC defensive line isn't going to be threatening. So those two data points do absolutely nothing for me. And uh, now that LSU comes out of the bye, they're either decimated with injury or as PC as I can put this, um, a couple guys are unavailable. So... You know, you look at LSU, best defensive player, Makai Wingo, had surgery for a lower body injury. He was LSU's best run defender on a team that's outside the top 90 in both rushing success rate and EPA per rush allowed. And now you get an Alabama ground game. It's starting to find its footing a little bit now that they're going with the right running back in the backfield. Um, Top 25 in both explosive rush percentage and, and power running. Then you look at the secondary, which is what you hinted at, Todd. Deuce Chestnut, Denver Harris are not with the team right now. And then you have starting corners, I Alexander, going to miss some extended time with an ankle injury. So you look at what this defense was supposed to be coming into the season. Those were thought to be LSU's top three cornerbacks. So, you know, it's it's rough. And when you look at what's going to be trotted out there this week, LSU is going to use their converted safety, say, Ryan at corner. And then you've got two three-star true freshmen in Ashton Stamps and Jeremiah Hughes that are going to play starter snaps with Latarian's Welch sprinkled into that mix. So I think it's uh, – a little rough for that secondary as much as people have kind of you know thought that that was an issue it feels like maybe even a larger one and, and you think about Joe Milton and I know you know we've had some question marks about some of the things that he can do in the throw game right he's not this go through all the progressions pocket passer but you just kind of look now with what they are asking him to do he's been really efficient this Bama offense you look it's just wildly explosive it's something I didn't expect coming into the season but we're talking about being on the cusp of top 10 in schedule adjusted explosive pass rate uh, top 10 in EPA per pass if you can believe it and this isn't like a great BAM receiver room by any stretch but Jalen Milrow has 17 big time throws to zero turnover worthy plays when thrown at 20 plus yards he's thrown the ball deep 23 percent of his dropbacks right I mean think about that 23 percent of the time he drops back to pass it's going 20 plus yards and it's not really a quantity thing if you look out of 154 qualifying quarterbacks Jalen Milrow has the third best adjusted accuracy on those deep throws LSU outside the top 100 and explosive pass defense so it's really interesting with what you know Matt House is going to be tasked with here if he likes to play off coverage right with with inexperienced corners to kind of keep those guys <laughs> uh, prevent them from from being exposed a little bit and you keep your safeties deep and you force Milro to throw underneath uh, you're gonna have to somehow stop the run with a light box right and, and I just don't know if you can do that without your best run defender so just kind of looking at this matchup you look at the metrics it kind of leads you to believe that eventually the dam's going to break and Alabama's going to have some offensive success here I mean, if I'm Matt House, uh, I'm either picking up the phone, calling Brian Flores and Wink Martindale going, how many guys should I blitz? Okay, I'm going to blitz 10 on every play and hope we get home to try and drum up some pressure for a team that's really struggled in that particular regard. Because to your point, down to down, I'm not sure this secondary can hold up uh, and eliminate some of the big plays. So LSU may have to match this Alabama offense score for score and figure out how to pick their poison to create a turnover, steal a possession here or there. Because from a down to down success standpoint, I'm not sure LSU LSU has the pieces or the blueprint to be able to make that happen. Should be one. You, go ahead. You need Smith and Perkins to go play like first round picks. Like they just have to disrupt the entire game for you to have a chance defensively. Right. You, we're we're, we're yeah. sending Harold Perkins on blitzes. We're, we're sending him right at the freshman, Caden Proctor. And we're saying, hey, go to work because 
yes, Joe Milton is is mobile. Jalen Milrow. Jalen Milrow. You mean? I'm sorry. Yes, Jalen Milrow. You know, yes, he is mobile, but he holds on to the ball. He does take a good amount of sacks. So I think it's one of those where you just have to unleash Harold Perkins and say, "Hey, go wreak havoc." And if you can create a turnover or two, steal a possession, that's yeah. that's the best way to go about it. Because if you're preventing the deep shot. <sighs> I think you're just going to get run on without Wingo there in the middle. Oh, it makes sense. And the final thing that I'll add for Alabama and some of their offensive struggles, I mean, this is a group that's allowed four-plus sacks in seven straight games. It's the longest active streak in the entire FBS and 119th in the country when it comes to allowing pressure on nearly 40% of dropbacks, 132nd of 133 teams when allowing sacks on 16.1% of quarterback dropbacks. Only Old Dominion has a higher rate. And gentlemen, I've watched a lot of college football in my 40 years. You never want to be neck and neck with Old Dominion in any football category if you're Alabama who prides themselves on winning national championships. So let's see what LSU can do defensively to take some of the pressure off that group uh, and try and get the ball back to the offense. But there is no doubt this game, at least on paper, if offenses get humming, could have uh, a little bit in the way of fireworks. From a rivalry in the SEC to the final or potential final installment in a rivalry in the Big 12 for Bedlam. It'll mark the 118th edition between Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. It's one of the oldest rivalries and one that'll be lost to realignment, unfortunately. It's the longest in our uninterrupted series in college football behind only Minnesota and Wisconsin. It's been going strong for 113 years. Now, I know Oklahoma State fans won't like this, but I'll say it anyways. Rivalry, a little bit of a loose term when you look at Oklahoma, who leads this series all time, 91-19-7. and Coach Gundy, just 3-15 and in 18 Bedlam matchups. Oklahoma had won six straight meetings before losing its last trip to Stillwater in 2021 by a 37-33 margin. When you look at these two teams, a lot on the stake as well in terms of fighting for a place at the table in Arlington for a conference championship. Two of five Big 12 teams tied atop the league standings at 4-1 four and one with four games remaining. Clearly, Oklahoma... Had a chance to uh, remain unbeaten last week. The coaching staff took a lion's share of the responsibility for the way they called plays on that final drive, electing to punt back to Kansas, and it was Jason Bean taking care of business. Meanwhile, Oklahoma State, four straight wins since losing back-to-back games against South Alabama at Iowa State, had lost five of their previous six Big 12 games coming into it. Payne, offensively for Oklahoma, we know they lost Andrell Anthony in the game against Texas, but that can't be the only reason albeit some weather in the mix, that they dropped Dylan Gabriel back 19 times to throw. They were sloppy with the football with three giveaways, and Gabriel was held out a touchdown pass for the first time last week versus Kansas. Now, his legs have provided a valuable component. Figuring out exactly what Oklahoma is going to do on the ground is anybody's best guess, uh, but that group proved to be a little bit more reliable than they had in previous weeks. It still didn't stop Oklahoma from failing to put up the gaudy numbers. In steps in Oklahoma State defense, that's trending in the right direction but there is a lot of boom and bust as well on that side of the ball yeah there's a lot of chatter going on this week if you've read some message boards and heard some of the interviews about Jeff Levy being too conservative recently and he had an extremely run heavy plan against Kansas last week 55 runs 26 dropbacks that turned into 19 pass attempts for for Dylan Gabriel and even when Oklahoma did pass it was all short 37% of Dylan Gabriel's passes last week were behind the line of scrimmage. Only 26% of Gabriel's throws exceeded nine yards. And I, you maybe try to understand it a little bit, right? He throws the early pick six, but after that, he completes 11 in a row. So at that point, Levy should have full confidence in his quarterback. And I know Venables addressed it this week. He thought the criticism from fans were, you know, was fair and that he expects to see a little bit more of an aggressive Oklahoma offense this Saturday. I, you and I have talked a little bit off air. The receiver group for Oklahoma is, is interesting. You, you kind of watch this offense enough and, and you can see where some of Levy's conservative approach comes from. There's lots of young, talented guys, right? Jacquez Petaway and Brendan Thompson. They're just not quite ready to be consistent go-to guys yet. You mentioned Andrew Anthony's season-ending injury. That was a big blow. And so somehow Drake Stoops leads the team in targets and receptions. That's fine. There's kind of like a limit on 
on Stoops' upside, and then you have, like, Gavin Freeman taking end arounds last week. He's, like, 5'7", 175 pounds. You can time him on a sundial. Like, there's there's a ceiling there, right? So then you look at Nick Anderson. He's kind of this burner, but he's still learning how to be a complete receiver. Jaleel Farouk is second on the team in target. Sounds great, but he's averaging 1.7 yards per route run. It's it's not a good number. And then you saw Levy kind of sprinkle Farouk in as a, you know, a runner last week, and he couldn't handle the between-the-tackles physicality and fumbled in a huge spot. It just feels like the most talented guys aren't ready to be dominant, consistent horses yet, and the guys that are contributing most have – a low ceiling and it's caused the Sooners offense to sputter against Cincinnati and SMU and have large stretches in other games where it, where it looks clunky. Um, Oklahoma state's defense to your point, Todd is, is trending in the right direction. Some, you know, questionable offenses the last couple games that they've played, but you look in, in totality, they have some issues, right? You can hit them for explosives on the ground. They're also outside the top 100 in EPA per pass allowed. So I, there isn't a reason that that Levy and the Sooners aren't a little bit more balanced this week. It sounds like Tywee Walker will play despite missing some some key possessions late in the fourth quarter against Kansas with that ankle injury. And I think that's really important because you look, he's averaging over 2.1 yards per rush before first contact. All of the other Sooners rushers barely above one and a half. So maybe their O line is a little bit of a larger question mark than we envision coming into the season. Uh, did lose a couple key cogs there to the NFL, but but Walker is the most efficient back. So having him uh, out there would be huge. Oklahoma State plays a, a 3 3 5. And, you know, they'll typically have like a fourth guy standing on the edge, but they give up over five yards a carry. And, you know, they send a lot of run blitzes. And you can pop an explosive when they lose integrity and, and do a nice job, I think, you know, uh, typically attacking the edge with that style of defense. Uh, Oklahoma State, when I look at them, still susceptible to the explosive pass. And I think that's important that, you know, you kind of mesh that with what's being said from the coaching staff that you'd envision a little bit more aggressiveness through the air. You kind of have to attack the seams of a of a three three five defense especially if they're sitting in cover three you have to take some aggressive vertical shots so you'd just love to see kind of nick anderson out there that speedster just you know going down the seam deep this is just tough for me as a as a whole because todd you and i talked a little bit um and i said on air last week i was i wanted to sell the sooners just kansas wasn't the spot for me so that that was stupid not to not to attack that, but I have no idea how five and a half became an option this week. That feels very short to me, but from what I'm hearing behind the scenes, um, potentially another battle here between the the numbers guys and uh, some of the older school thought processes from guys who, who bet the largest money. So I, I wanted to make a case for Oklahoma because I felt like five and a half was just really short. But um, I, I'm probably not going to be doing that uh, like I envisioned earlier in this week. Yeah, to your point, a couple five and a half still out there. We'll call the consensus a six with a 61 uh, with this game. And, you know, watching the game for Oklahoma State last weekend, to your point, they were pretty buttoned up defensively against the run, but there is no doubt Cincinnati had the opportunity to hit a couple explosive plays. They just weren't able to do it enough, and it shows up in some of the other efficiency metrics where Oklahoma State has a knack for creating negative plays, but they also allow explosive dra- explosive drives at a rate that doesn't leave you brimming with confidence. Now, offensively, Brad, Oklahoma State has begun to find an identity uh, with Alan Bowman at quarterback and Ollie Gordon's explosive potential taking over. They've scored 27 plus since Bowman became the primary signal caller. He's now started the last seven games came off the bench in the opener against Central Arkansas, thrown exactly two passing touchdowns in three straight games and four of the last five games. Uh, But it's all about Ollie Gordon. 250-plus rushing yards in the last two games. He becomes the second player in Oklahoma State history to do that. The other, pretty good company if you're being mentioned in the same breath as Barry Sanders. And he's the first running back to do it in the FBS since Jarrett Patterson did it at Buffalo back in 2020. But it's not just running the football. It's also his ability to catch the ball. We saw him at 160 16 yards receiving on six catches against Kansas in steps a Sooners defense that struggled a little bit with a mobile quarterback but when you look at this side of the ball knowing that Oklahoma is banged up defensively Brad is there a decided edge to be found when you're handicapping these two groups 
Yeah, I don't know if there's a bigger drastic turnaround on any unit on any team in the entire country than Oklahoma State offensively from what we saw the first month of the season to what we've seen the last four weeks. So a month ago, if you'd asked me who has the edge in this matchup, I would have said clearly edge Oklahoma. Now uh, with what we've seen transpire, not only from Oklahoma State's offensive improvements, but Oklahoma's defense the last few weeks, I'm going to give the slight edge to Oklahoma State here. And let's talk about those improvements that Oklahoma State made. I mean, let's go back to the start of the season, though. I mean, Central Arkansas, Arizona State, South Alabama, not exactly a murderer's row when it comes to non-conference. 20 points per game, 322 yards per game, 119 rushing yards per game, less than four yards per carry, and they allowed eight sacks in those three non-conference games. Last four weeks, after the bye, 40 points per game for the Oklahoma State offense, 515 yards per game, 247 rushing yards per game, nearly seven yards per carry, one sack allowed. Improvements, I mean, significant improvements, almost double across the board. So so what happened? A multitude of things. Number one, they changed up their blocking schemes a little bit, a little bit more zone. They, they, they had an experienced offense line, but they had a couple transfers. They've certainly gelled. You mentioned it. Uh, stopping the musical chairs at quarterback certainly helped. Even though Bowman's got the last seven starts, they were still rotating quarterbacks a few games. At that stop the last four weeks. Alan Bowman's not great, but at least you have a little bit more stability there and an experienced player than what you had with Gundy's kid running around that wrangle kid uh, that I'd like to wrangle and that I'd like to wrangle around the neck a few times in a couple of those games. But the major story and maybe the story in college football the last couple of weeks, Ollie Gordon. I mean, you look at these numbers, these total yards rushing and receiving, 284, 282, 292. You mentioned it. That's Barry Sanders' 1988 Heisman, what, what many consider to be maybe the best statistical season in the history of college football. That's some good company to be in. Uh, he's just getting touches. He didn't get any touches in those non-conference games. Had a total of 19 carries in those games. Last three games, 83 carries. So getting him some touches, sorting out the offensive line, stopping musical chairs at quarterback, you got a pretty decent offense. Now, I have, still have some concerns here. I don't see a, a guy that scares me at the wide receiver position. Uh, Presley's their go-to slot guy. But uh, I'm in a matchup against Oklahoma, I mean, uh, again, I, if I'm Oklahoma, it's clear you, you're going to put it. You're going to try to put as many guys in the box as possible. To stop Gordon, and if Bowman beats you, then then you tip your cap to the kid. Uh, speaking of the Oklahoma defense, you mentioned it a little bit banged up. It starts with Danny Stutzman, their leading tackler, ankle injury against Kansas last week. Venable says he's feel feels good about it, but game time decision. I think he's questionable at best. Uh, re, you know, reading the tea leaves a little bit there. So uh, that, that's a you pull him out of that lineup. If you watch any Oklahoma game this year, I mean, he's been the main cog in that middle constantly um, around the football. So that would be a significant loss if he can't go. Uh, generally speaking, when it comes to Oklahoma's defense and the team as a whole, I man, Payne kind of touched on this. I'm just kicking myself. First four or five weeks, everybody's talking up Oklahoma, and I'm watching these games, and I'm just not seeing it, not seeing it uh, across the board, offensively, defensively. And then the Texas game happens, two fronts. Money comes in significantly on Oklahoma. That money turns out to be right, and I kind of wave the white flag on as far as saying, ah, Oklahoma's not that good. Uh, and then the last two games happen. Markets against Oklahoma after the bye, and they almost lose outright both games with Kansas getting home last week. Uh defensively certainly improved compared to what they were last year compared to what they they were for the majority of the Lincoln Riley tenure but was it against weak competition I mean little sisters of the poor in non-conference I mean they're allowing less than 10 points per game less than 300 yards per game less than 100 rushing yards per game last four weeks not so much 29 points per game 430 yards per game uh, 170 rush yards per game Stutzman uh, banged up or not in the lineup Ooh, that, that's tough look there I mean, they got some nice players. Billy Bowman's a decent safety. Ethan Downs is a good player off the edge, but I, I don't see a lot of elite defenders. And it's similar to Payne breaking down the wide receiver position. I don't. I see a a, a good team, not a great team. Uh, and you know, I can't believe I'm saying this, but Oklahoma State offensively, I think, has a little bit of the edge here. 
Pretty wild to see how much things can change, and it's a credit to Coach Gundy and his coaching staff, what they've been able to do. Because it, to your point, Brad, if you'd have told me that Oklahoma State was in this spot to potentially contend for a conference championship when I watched them get absolutely annihilated by South Alabama on their home field, uh, it has been a full 180, to say the least. You mentioned the injuries for Oklahoma. Maybe a little bit of a silver lining in the defensive backfield. Gentry Williams was at DNP versus Kansas. When asked if it was a long-term injury, Venable said, I don't think it's long-term. Uh, hopefully Williams could be back in that secondary as Oklahoma will need all hands on deck to win the final installment in this Bedlam rivalry. You can follow Brad on X at Brad Power 7. You can follow Payne there as well at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. Follow me on social media. But most importantly, for all things Bet the Board, follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. Uh, and gentlemen, we've covered a lot of games that will take place at night, so we'll hit the rewind button and go to the middle of the day where Missouri, fresh off a bye, goes into Athens looking to end Georgia's long winning streak. They'll have to do so as a 16-point underdog in a game with a total of 54.5. Last year's meeting between these teams was the only SEC game that Georgia won by single digits. Missouri... They're one of a handful of teams across the country that truly controls its own postseason destiny as, look, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, but a one-loss Missouri team, if they were to run the table in the SEC, probably has a legitimate claim to getting into the college football playoff, but they are 0-17 all-time versus AP number one teams in the country. It includes losses to Georgia over the, each of the last two seasons. Meanwhile, the Georgia Bulldogs, fresh off the cocktail party, scored 36 straight points after falling behind 7-0 early in that game and cruising to a 43-20 win. Over the Gators, they've outgained their opponents by 234 yards per game. It's the highest rate in the FBS. 25 straight wins marks the fourth longest win streak in SEC history, and 26 would also tie for the 15th longest in college football's modern era. When we look at these two teams, Brad, offensively for Missouri, that's been the strength of the Tigers all year long. They're the only team with a player in the top three of the SEC in passing yards, Brady Cook, rushing yards, Cody Schrader, and receiving yards in Luther Burden. Kirby Moore's system clearly paying dividends to get this offense humming on all cylinders. And if you look at Georgia... I know that this defense isn't a slouch by any stretch, but they're there for the taking, relatively speaking, compared to what we've seen from Georgia defensively in the past. I mean, you look at the efficiency numbers, you look at the points per game. It's not an elite stop unit by what Kirby Smart has built down there over the last handful of seasons. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you can see a pathway for, for Missouri to, to have some success here. Uh, anxious to see what they do coming off the bye. Uh, man, I, I do Going back to the Oklahoma State offense, I mean, another dramatic improvement. If you watch the second half of this Missouri offense against South Dakota and you watch the game against Middle Tennessee, you would not have foresaw uh, what you've seen offensively the last six games. That's scoring at least 30 points in all six games. Uh, they don't – I'll break it down. I'll try to grade them at a tougher scale, though. Uh, you know, obviously looks good. Some of the counting stats you mentioned, Brady Cook's taking care of the football, top 20 in QBR, only thrown three picks. He gives you a little bit of uh, a run game, a quarterback run game with five rushing touchdowns. Uh, Schrader, kids, a solid back, 800 yards rushing, nine TDs. He's he's good. Uh, he's gotten them good, good enough to get them to a 7-1 and one start. I just think you're taking a step up in class here, even though it's not an elite Georgia defense it's still by far the best defense that, that Missouri's faced so far this season. I think the guy to, to keep an eye on, obviously, their best player, uh, a guy that is elite. He was elite coming out of high school as a five-star. He's been elite for them, uh, is Luther Burden, the wide receiver. Uh, but a, a kid that they do try to get the ball significantly, and Kirby Moore's done a really good job of featuring him in, uh, obviously, the wide receiver screen game. They try to get him the ball in other avenues, and I, I'm – curious to see how the what, what the game plan is trying to get him as many touches as possible coming off the bye because you know I saw Florida kind of use this against Georgia's defense last week they got the talented freshman Eugene Wilson the ball early burnt the Georgia defense they got that touchdown on the opening drive <laughs> then Georgia made adjustments and goodbye uh, Eugene Wilson the rest of that game uh, I got another key guy I think that that's going to get some opportunities because you, you know Georgia's going to roll over the coverage uh, against Burden but Theo Weiss talented kid Oklahoma transfer has been solid for them I, to me, it's just Brady Cook. Uh, you know, how can he avoid the bad play he's done so, so far this year? Can he make the big plays consistently? Because you're going to have to to consistently hit the shots. And 
I just see some inconsistency out of him. I think he's a decent player. He's not the guy. I mean, don't believe me. I mean, the, the, the last two seasons, they've tried to unseat him at the quarterback position. Even his own head coach has, has maybe has looked for other a- a- opportunities, you know, getting transfers, trying to, you know, over-recruit him over the top. Uh, and kudos for Brady Cook uh, for, for standing pat and, and, and still being the guy there. I just – I don't know. When, when I think about – these elite Georgia D teams, the elite Alabama teams, and what it takes to beat one of these teams in recent college football history, it takes an elite quarterback a lot of times, and Brady Cook's not that guy for me. Uh, on the Georgia side, I, it's it's a top 10 defense. It, it's certainly not as good as their generational defenses from a couple years ago. We'd like to see more pressure on the quarterback. Payne mentioned this last week. Didn't see it in non-conference. They didn't even try to generate it. It's pretty much, you know, we'll, we'll have our three guys up front uh, that, that are five-star recruits, and, and we're not going to load the box too much. They did bring a little bit more pressure last week, and they have brought a little bit more pressure in conference play. Uh, the, the thing that really worried me, if you're looking at data points, was that Auburn game. Man, Auburn got some push up front. But that seems that you watch, you know, the Kentucky game, you watch the Florida game, that seems to be the outlier uh, the Auburn game. So to me, I think George George is probably a little bit buttoned up more on defense than what I expected just a few weeks ago. Uh, to me, I'm going to give the slight edge to Georgia here. Uh, the, even though Missouri's got the good counting stats, I just don't think they've faced anybody nearly as good as this Georgia defense. It sounds dumb to say, Brad, but I'm going to ask the question anyways. How much do you think Georgia was holding back, knowing that their schedule early in the year wasn't going to challenge them the same way they realized, starting with Florida, essentially, that the November push was going to define their season? Looked like it last week because, I mean, well, I'll also say the Kentucky game as well. Just looked like a different team, different energy level. Uh, like they're running on different speeds. It's like, you know, you have those different speeds to, to watch YouTube videos and, <laughs> and stuff. I mean, it's like I changed the speed. I mean, when they came out, I was like, holy cow, that first half against Florida. It's like, I haven't seen this from Georgia all year. Yeah, I think – and when you're playing 15 games now and you've got a backloaded schedule when you count the playoffs and the SEC championship game, uh, makes sense. You know, keep your, your snap counts low uh, against less than quality competition. Don't do too much schematically. Uh, I, I think that was probably the, the, the formula when, when Ker- Kirby was looking at the season on how to you know to handle it. It makes a ton of sense. You almost have to look at it with an NFL-type mentality that you raise your level of play when you need it to, and you're not going to win a national championship playing your best in September. You want to be peaking when the stakes are at their highest. And Payne, when we talk about peaking, Georgia's offense has done uh, an awful lot over recent weeks to open people's eyes. This is a Georgia team that has surpassed their 2022 mark with 14 plays of 40 plus yards and are now tied with LSU for the most plays from scrimmage over 50 yards with seven. Georgia and explosive offense aren't typically synonyms for one another or mentioned in the same breath, but you look at what Carson Beck is doing now, second in the SEC in passing yards and third in completion percentage. He's one of only two FBS quarterbacks along with Bo Nix to complete at least 65% of his passes in every game this season. Had a season high 11.3 passing yards per attempt and an efficiency rating of 186 in the win against Florida. Uh, I mean, clearly we weren't sure how Georgia's offense was going to look without Brock Bowers, but Lad McConkey comes back healthy and ties his career high with six receptions and 135 yards after he had 107 coming into the game. You have a Missouri transfer in Dominic Lovett, who I'm sure would love to show out against the program that he transferred from. But maybe more importantly, Georgia getting back to running the football. They've now accumulated 170 plus rushing yards in each of the last three games. Georgia's offense against Missouri's defense. I have a pretty good gut instinct in terms of who has the edge. It's just a question of how decided it might be for what Georgia can do offensively. Especially the way Georgia's offense is is trending. It looks like Bobo and, and Beck are in rhythm and Carson Beck specifically is is you know getting more comfortable. We knew the talent was there, right? It was like a top five pro style quarterback in the twenty twenty class. But what's interesting is they did an interview with him last week. And he came out and said, hey, I haven't played a meaningful football game in like four years since the start of this season, right? Because he kept getting beat out. And so it kind of took him a while to get his confidence back. He's like, you know, they plopped me on the field. I just had no idea if I was the same guy I was uh, when I was in, you know, a senior in high school. And now he's got adjusted and reacclimated to game speed since the second half of the Auburn game. I mean, he's he's been in fuego 
mentioned that data point against Kentucky's defense. You know, obviously their secondary leaves much to be desired, but it was a it was a very good performance from him. And George has been a little bit more pass happy overall this season, although that ground game to your point, Todd, is is gotten going recently. I I kind of felt like Georgia took its foot off the gas last week. And they could have hung a much bigger number on Florida if they wanted to. The O-line potentially getting healthier if left tackle and Marius Mims return. He was in full pads for the Florida game and said he wasn't quite there but wanted to be available in case of an emergency. So that would kind of signal to me Mims is, is getting extremely close. It'd be nice to have your starting left tackle back. Uh, the Missouri defense is solid. Right, it's it's not elite by any stretch. They did a good job though slowing Georgia's offense down last season, if you remember. And you got the same DC back in Blake Baker. You have eight returning starters. You have two weeks to prepare. So maybe that's the the saving grace where this isn't like a complete and utter just uh, mauling on that side of the ball. You go through the schedule though. Aside from LSU. Missouri really hadn't been tested much this season through the air and Missouri's defense kind of lost that test by by a landslide and so you know you're looking at a defense right now that's outside the top 70 in strength of schedule they're still outside the top 70 in EPA per pass allowed outside the top 90 in explosive pass rate allowed haven't been able to get off the field on late downs either so it does leave you a little bit concerned there for Missouri's defense maybe the saving grace is the secondary getting a little bit healthier? I saw that uh, Ennis Rakestraw Jr., the top-graded defender on Missouri's defense, is back. That's a nice corner tandem with with Rakestraw and Abrams Drain. The latter is having a monster season, allowing 38% reception rate when targeted and a 31 passer rating. The other glaring matchup, and obviously it, it comes with some variance, is the green zone. Georgia's done a fantastic job finishing drives this season. Top 20 in the country, averaging nearly five points per green zone trip. That's starting to improve as that ground game gets going a little bit. And prior to the, you know, Shane Beamer field goal festival there, uh, Missouri had really struggled mightily um, in that green zone. They're allowing over four and a half points to opponents um, that reached their 40. They're still outside the top 90 in that department. So you start to kind of wonder where the path is for a ton of stops for Missouri uh, but again that game plan last year was was really good for for Blake and, and you do have two weeks to repair and you're getting a little bit healthier in the back so um, interesting matchup here for for me and I think ultimately you know we've seen some money on Missouri in this market I I don't know how that necessarily correlates with the under and if it does right it's got to be this side of the ball so maybe there's there's something we're, we're, we're missing here, Todd. But uh, again, you, you did like Blake's game plan last year with the two weeks repair, a little bit healthier for secondary. Maybe they can give Georgia a little bit more of a challenge than, than we see on the surface. Yeah, you mentioned the uh, unique correlation unfolding there. You've seen a little bit of a tick down from a peak of 56 on the total. We know Georgia doesn't run at breakneck pace, barely inside the top 100. Missouri pretty close to national average in the mid-60s. Uh, and it's always interesting when you look at how these markets move in harmony or conjunction or against one another. And uh, to your point, if Missouri is indeed going to be the side and the total is coming down, their defense is going to have to raise its level of play because Georgia's offense appears to be finding stride and an identity when it's going to need to uh, over the next three weeks when it takes on Missouri, Ole Miss, and Tennessee before they'll close their regular season as they always do against Georgia Tech for that in-state rivalry game. You mentioned efficiency in the green zone and a team that wasn't efficient really in the red zone last week was the Texas Longhorns. And they'll have to be significantly better there, converting drives between the 20s into points when they welcome Kansas State into Austin. It's Texas, a four, four and a half point favorite. Total in the game as low as 49 and a half at a prominent offshore locale, but we'll call 50 and a half more or less the consensus. And Texas has won six straight versus Kansas State. Five of those seven, five of those games, however, have been decided by seven points or fewer. Kansas State has now lost five straight in Austin, but the last three by a combined 14 points. 
or when you look at these teams overall, defenses are the Big 12's top two in opponent points per game. Kansas State 15.9, Texas at 16, second and third in the conference in total defense, second and third in the conference in opponent yards per play, and first and third in the conference when it comes to getting off the field on third downs. Kansas State, for the first time, held consecutive opponents to three or fewer points since 2015. It's only the third time this century that it's happened. No three-game streak since 1995. Meanwhile, Texas, they've been an under team, especially at home. Seven of their last eight home games, all under the total. They're 6-2 and two to the under this year, tied for the fourth best mark in the FBS, and the under for Texas is hit in seven straight home games against AP-ranked opponents. Payne, when we look at Kansas State offensively, it's the second best rushing offense in the Big 12, number five rushing offense in the country, churning out an average of 226 yards per game, and a lot of that comes from the quarterback position. They've adopted a little bit more of a two-quarterback style with Will Howard starting every game, but true freshman Avery Johnson getting more and more reps although hasn't scored a rushing touchdown in the last few games doing it through the air and with a very talented running back in DJ Giddens against the Texas defense that did everything they could to stymie BYU last week and came up smelling like roses in Malik Murphy's debut yeah I mean it it feels vanilla and obvious but it's all about the trench on this side of the matchup K-State's offensive line, if you remember coming into the season, was you know lauded as being one of the best in the Big 12 with all five starters returning. But they finally got a little bit healthier in recent weeks. There was a lot of mixing and matching going on, especially on the right side of that O-line. But it feels like now that it's a little bit healthier and, and you're seeing what they're doing in recent weeks, it's kind of helped find this new identity. 142 rushing attempts the last three games. So the ground game certainly building confidence with Giddens, who you mentioned, and then Sprinkle and Alil Treshawn Ward. It's a it's a nice dynamic duo there. And then you get Will Howard um, in the run game, creating that extra man advantage in the box. And you have a Kansas State team that's averaging more than three yards per rush before first contact. You look at Kansas State's O-line kind of on the cusp right now of being top 10 in schedule adjusted offensive line yards created. Over 52% of K-State's runs have grade successful, and it's not just the down-to-down efficiency. K-State's ground game has been pretty explosive as well. Um, now, you probably do have to question some of the recent run defenses uh, that they've built this confidence again. It's, it's you know, Texas Tech, it's TCU, it's, it's Houston. The average run defense of those three teams outside the top 80 in EPA per rush allowed on on average. So um, not the the stiffest test. And now you are stepping up in class. You're going out on the road. And this is the best defensive front Texas has had in, in ages. Top 15 in defensive line yards have it created tackles for loss. And you look at all of that stuff being created behind the line of scrimmage. It's now a top 10 defense in both rushing success rate allowed and EPA per rush allowed. So if Texas can stalemate Kansas State's ground game, you know, there's not a there's not a ton of paths here for for this offense. I don't think, right? You kind of want to make Will Howard, you know, force you to, to to beat him with his arm and not on his terms. His terms is you know the ground game going, and we can occasionally throw that shot off play action where he's been somewhat efficient. But if you get them in a state where it's you know second and long, third and medium, and suddenly he's sitting there in the shotgun and forced to pass that way. Um, that's where kind of Will Howard struggles. He hasn't been overly accurate when he's not being assisted by play action. He's not very efficient if you um, don't blitz him and make the read for him, so to speak, right? You just want to make him go through the progressions, read, throw accurately on time, and, and you know you have a Texas defense that likes to play with five defensive backs. So trying to find those windows is kind of difficult for Will Howard in those specific situations. Texas also got one of its lead corners back in Ryan Watts for the BYU game. Sounds like Barron will play despite the injury concern there against BYU. The other one injury I think worth monitoring for Texas and, and Sark, and he said this is you know week-to-week thing, is, is Ethan Burke. He's kind of their hybrid linebacker edge. He's been fantastic as a run defender this season. Jet Bush was his replacement um, last week. Has experience, just not the same player, and maybe that's where – if you're K State, maybe you're you're trying that outside zone and, and run right at Jet Bush. But aside from that, I just I don't see a path where Kansas State is necessarily able to kind of uh, enforce their will on the ground like we've seen from them the last three weeks. 
this Texas defense is the real deal. They've stood up to most tests, and uh, to your point, it's going to be fascinating to watch the number one run defense in the Big 12 against the one of the top rushing offenses that we've seen in the league. Now, when we look at Texas offensively, Brad, the Longhorns are one of four FBS teams to score 30-plus points in every game this season, along with Florida State, Michigan, and Oregon. The eight-game streak is Texas's longest since 2008 and third longest at the FBS level since 1902. Uh, behind only a 12-game streak that they put together in 2005 to 2006. But Sark called out his offense, said, we've been elite moving the ball between the 20s, but we're bogging down way too frequently in the red zone. We saw a couple of goal-to-go situations last week against BYU lead them to come up empty-handed. Malik Murphy in his starting debut, I don't want to put words in anyone else's mouth, but the first thing that jumped to mind was underwhelming. I guess that's probably the best area to start because you watch these guys in spring – you said Malik Murphy looked like you know he was significantly polished. I don't know if it was by design to try and ease him into the depths of playing a conference game, uh, but you look at Murphy and there were flashes of brilliance, but for the most part, left me wanting a little bit more. Yeah, so a few things. Uh, you mentioned the 30-point streak, uh, scoring at least 30 points in every game this season. I'm here to tell you, could be in jeopardy for Texas this week. Uh, Malik Murphy, for me, yeah, I did watch the spring game. I, I don't think I was alone in thinking that, that he was super impressive. There was a lot of colleges around the country that wanted him to transfer out of Texas. Hey, you're not going to be the starter. Arch Manning is there behind you, waiting yep. in the wings. Yep. He's the future. Uh, people want – he was a hot commodity – and so, you know, my initial downgrade from Quinn Ewers, who, you know, I agree with Payne, what was, you know, not the elite quarterback, wasn't going to win the Heisman, but still was playing at a top 20 level when you look at weighted EPA, number 15 in QBR. I thought Murphy, yeah, three-point downgrade. This is a physical specimen. They'll be fine. They got an offensive-minded coach. After watching that performance, I don't know if three <laughs> points was enough. Oh, my goodness, because I'll tell you a couple of things stood out to me. First off, a couple of bad turnovers by Murphy. The interception was completely inexcusable there. Just, I mean, basically threw it to the defender under pressure. That one's got to go out of bounds. Uh, and if you take a, you know, the, uh, the, if you take grounding, you take grounding in that uh, perspective. The other one was, look, he didn't get hit that much. But the one time he did get hit where Jonathan Brooks, uh, you know, whiffed on, on some quarterback uh, protection, uh, Murphy fumbled the ball. You're a big kid. You can't – anytime you get hit, you can't fumble it. Uh, and then the other th- things that bothered me, a couple of goal line, fourth down, short yard situations, failed. And, and BYU is not that great up front defensively this year. So there were some major concerns. And I thought they really got bailed out by the defense that, that Payne and you guys mentioned already. Also got bailed out by the special teams where they had a, a punt return touchdown in that game. Yep. To me, if you're not buttoned up, if you're failing on, on short yard situations, if you're turning it over, that's exactly how you get beat against a team like Kansas State. So uh, certainly a concern. You throw out the Wyoming game coming off the big win against uh, – Alabama, the Houston BYU games have been their two worst offensive performances. Uh, Jonathan Brooks has been getting going. We kind of mentioned it. Hey, this Texas run game isn't as good as what we thought. But starting with that Kansas game, he's kind of been the go-to guy. I think he'll be the go-to guy here if you don't trust your quarterback. Uh, in fact, Brooks, I mean, was the highest graded running back per uh, pro football focus last week. Uh, he's been, been adept of, uh, you know, forcing missed tackles. In fact, it leads to power five. Uh, to me, I, you know, how much does Sark go to the pass game? Because I think there is an advantage here. Kansas State defensively has not seen guys like Worthy and Mitchell so far this season. In one game they did against, uh, you know, Luther Burden and Missouri's wide receiver unit, they lost the game. Uh, up front for Texas, I'm not completely sold yet, still young. Christian Jones has played well, but mm, I – on a down and a down out basis, I, I they're still they're a year away on the offensive line. You talk Kansas State, boy, metrically you're you're not overwhelmed. I mean, number forty in yards per play allowed, number forty five in yards per game allowed. The best thing they do, you mentioned it, Todd. They keep scoring down, especially the last couple of weeks. But what worries me is, and maybe not so much for this game, but you know, down the line, if you're looking to find value, if you're looking to make the manual adjustment. As the Kansas State defense has faced a backup quarterback against UCF, backup quarterback TCU, backup quarterback Texas Tech, backup quarterback here. Uh, so I, I'm not sure that I'm getting a lot of great data points for saying how good this defense is. The success rates are good. Fundamentally is really good. Scheme is good. They don't create a lot of havoc, uh, which 
I would like to see in a game like this, if you're going to get a chance to win the game outright, you want a defense that can force some turnovers. So I, I got a lot more questions and answers in this matchup. Can Kansas State get pressure? Can they force turnovers? You know, how do they defend Texas? I'm kind of intrigued by, do you load up the box, stop Brooks, and force, you know, Murphy to beat you over the top? Uh, yeah, it sounds good, that, like that could be the plan. But, I mean, you are putting your corners on an island against more talented wide receivers, and Murphy does have some arm strength. So uh, I, I think it's probably a little bit of uh, – they're, they're going to mix it up, try to confuse Murphy. Uh, this is a tough one for me. Uh, I, I'm going to give a – you know, all season long I would have said, hey, clear edge Texas here in this matchup. Boy, after what I saw last week, uh, that slight edge Kansas State here for me. It almost feels, Brad, like if I'm in the coaching room with Joe Klanderman, the defensive coordinator for Kansas State, you have to take that bend but don't break mentality. I'm going to allow Texas to beat me up running the football. I'm not going to give up the explosives over the top. And if we can hold Texas to field goals, knowing how inefficient they've been in the red zone, we have to see that as a win. To your point, knowing that they can't create havoc, that they haven't been able to force a lot of turnovers, get them behind the down and distance, and force Texas to make Malik Murphy throw the ball into tight windows because in known running situations and goal to go, BYU was more than happy to man up and they got a little bit of penetration. There wasn't much confidence in Malik Murphy throwing into the end zone. And when he did do so, it looked like he was nowhere close to players wearing burnt orange jerseys. There wasn't, and basically, and BYU's not a, a a good team. I mean, if you don't believe me, look at the market. They're a ten point underdog against West Virginia this week. Kansas State is basically BYU, better coached, more talented. Uh, so it's going to be a very interesting matchup. Where uh, you know, again, edge Kansas State here for me. One last thing on this game, guys. Uh, Payne, I come to you on it. Have you seen anything in terms of side or total of note in this contest with the market? You know, kind of staying strong in that four, four and a half range. You mentioned the slight touch of under money that's come in, but wasn't quite sure. A little bit more than a slight touch with with the fifty one being key, but that is that's what I've seen so far is a little bit of under money there. Um, I think you guys hit it perfectly in terms of. Texas is getting that ground game going a little bit more. Some questions about Malik Murphy. He was fine last week when he wasn't pressured. That's kind of the, you know, Brad hit it perfectly in that, like, if you can get pressure on him, that's where his two turnover-worthy throws uh, happened last week. He had a 27 passer rating when under pressure from a clean pocket. It was 121. It kind of feels like you almost want that that Jalen Milrow-type offense where we're running the ball, we're throwing it short or taking that calculated deep shot to our, our yeah. you know, speedy receivers down the field. And we're not asking him to read the defense. We're not asking him to throw in the short and intermediate windows because that's where he struggled last week. The one thing that I would you know, have some hesitation here for is, yes, Texas may have struggled a little bit in those red zone areas and in the green zone areas, but you know, they're pretty fortunate last week. They got the special team score. They had a lot of short fields. I mean, there was numerous times where the field position was was fantastic for Texas. And so if Kansas State can go out there and, and not turn it over um, and you make Texas actually work the ball down the field, you, you could see why, you know, under 51 and a half and, and 52 was was hit here. Hey, we talk about all the time in college games. If you can make some of these young quarterbacks methodically move it, put together 10 to 12 play drives, you tip your hat to them because more often than not, there's a holding penalty, there's a miscue, there's something to take them off sequence. And I think Kansas State, to Brad's point, is the kind of disciplined defense that doesn't wow you with NFL caliber athletes, but can be smart enough now that they've simplified the scheme to go out there and at least complicate things for a young quarterback who's going to see some very different looks that he didn't last week against Kalani Sataki's BYU. Cougars. You can follow Brad on Twitter at Brad Power 7. You can follow Payne there as well. I'm Todd Furman. Follow me on social media. Most importantly, for all things Bet the Board, follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. All right, my friend, it's the time of the show where we've given a all of the actionable information to our loyal listeners, but identifying where we're going ahead for best bet land and an opportunity to get to the window on Saturday. Here's what we can promise. This game is not going to move in our favor five and a half points. However, it may win. <laughs> that's, a fa- that's a fair assessment when the sharpest guys in the world are taking a number after we come in on Purdue at plus three minus $1.20. Didn't have a chance, yeah. Um, yes, I, you know, you want them to go better. 
And unlike the stock market, you can't just cash out once you've beaten the market. You then have to rely upon 18-year-old kids. But I, I still feel good about giving listeners uh, plus three, minus 20, and probably having the better that everyone in the world knows most come in and, and, and take one and a half. So I feel good about getting listeners on a game before that gentleman. <laughs> in saying that, um, we're going back to the SEC. I think when we look at this game here, Todd, you and I have, have talked, the number is is showing some value for us. The spot looks pretty good here. And then there's some internal changes going on. Let's go with 399 Arkansas plus the six and a half. You want to talk about this one a little bit? Yeah, I mean, when you look at this Arkansas team, you mentioned some of the changes. Out is Dan Enos as offensive coordinator after what we would best describe as a lethargic three-point offensive outburst before the bye week against Mississippi State. Kenny Guyton, who's worked with the offensive line a good amount, is going to take over. Arkansas has talked a little bit about trying to go at a faster pace and tempo. Uh, we've seen some over money come in the market from some of the groups that we talked to as well uh, behind that particular total. And as a result, I think it puts KJ Jefferson in a much better spot not to sit there at the line of scrimmage have to survey defenses get out there read and react they talked about scaling back their playbook substantially trimming it down about 30 to 40 percent and while Arkansas doesn't have a boatload of playmakers look Darren McFadden ain't coming through that door anytime soon to try and help this ground game you look at the way that Arkansas has played and when they went through the gauntlet beginning in late September of the SEC West at LSU you lose by a field goal against Texas A&M on a neutral you fight tooth and nail. You can't really move the ball offensively, uh, but it doesn't change the dynamic against an elite defensive line. You go on the road to Oxford against Ole Miss, and you're able to hang around there catching nearly two touchdowns. Against Alabama, you're getting blown out in that game early. You fight, and you claw your way back in the game to lose by a field goal, and then you kind of bottom out at Mississippi State. Meanwhile, on the other side for Florida, this is a Gators team who clearly emptied the tank and then some against Georgia last week. They have a big date on deck against another SEC East rival early start time in Gainesville much better than being at night who would blame Florida if they're a little bit lethargic getting out of the gates in a spot where I'm not sure they're going to be able to run it a ton uh, when you look at Arkansas if they have a strength defensively they've been slightly above average in recent weeks being able to take away the run so I think there's a lot of factors that line up this late in the year with a team coming off a bye uh, a little bit of a chance to hit the refresh button and if Arkansas is going to show anything you're going to get their best effort on Saturday afternoon uh, in Florida. Yeah, I, th- I think for me, you know, the biggest thing here is price. I almost had to do a double take and then I, I, I shot Brad a note and I said, you know, fire over your power numbers. And I did a double take there. And, and you know, <laughs> as as bad as the record is for Arkansas and discussions of potentially moving on from its its head coach at the end of the season, like, you know, we're both kind of in that one, one and a half range in terms of Arkansas, Florida on a neutral. I think you'd be hard pressed to find a tougher four game schedule in the entire country than LSU, AM, Ole Miss, and Alabama. So it, it it there's a reason why you kind of no show here against Mississippi State. You get the bye week, you regroup, you freshen up, you change your offensive identity. And that identity is something to this point Florida really hasn't seen on film either. So I, I think you're gonna get a good effort here from Arkansas, the best potentially of of their season in the spot. But you're also going out there and saying, hey, you know, Florida, go in by margin. And I, I think that might be a little bit more difficult to do. To your point, they emptied the tank there uh, against Georgia. So uh, Arkansas, rotation number 399 plus the six and a half. And what's interesting, too, you mentioned the power number disparity that you're showing in the market. Keep in mind, Arkansas is a preseason win total. where We went under because of how daunting we thought that schedule was. And, you know, while you don't get the results from a straight up standpoint, Arkansas has been halfway decent at the betting window, which says there is a little bit of market efficiency. They're actually better against the spread than Florida. Uh, and I think it's a stock indicator here that you can sell one stock that's propped up a little bit more based on perception and buy one at the bottom of the market with some changes that we think could have at least a short-term tick up over a 60-minute sample size. What's the spread if you somehow don't have the miraculous double-digit come from behind four minutes to go win at South Carolina? I think you're talking about this game in in the four range instead of six and a half. Yeah, yeah. 
that that that's my vibe. So I uh, know where you're coming from there. Florida continues to fight for bowl eligibility. Thankfully for Gators fans and hopefully for us, you're going to have to wait another week. We'll get Arkansas as a live underdog in this spot. Anything else you'd like to share with the loyal listeners, kind sir? That's it. All right. Back tomorrow. NFL. Closing up shop. Big NFL card. A lot of marquee matchups. You know we will bring the A game as we always do around these parts. Best of luck with all of your college and football investments this weekend. And Saturday afternoon with an Arkansas ticket in hand, we'll see you at the window. We hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of Bet the Board. Make sure you follow Todd and Payne on X. Todd is at Todd Furman. That's T-O-D-D-F-U-H-R-M-A-N. And Payne is at Payne Insider. That's P-A-Y-N-E-I-N-S-I-D-E-R. Don't forget, our weekly newsletter comes with an additional best bet. Have that delivered to your inbox by clicking the link atop the podcast show notes. And most importantly, subscribe and download Bet the Board. We're on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Wondery, YouTube, Google Podcasts, and all your other major platforms.